Please be seated. On behalf of the George Robert Rakestraw family, we want to welcome you. Thank you for coming. We appreciate this support. We realize we can uh, certainly be sorrow on this occasion and yet celebrate that each of us knew George. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can gather. Yes, our hearts do have sorrow. We have lost a friend, a family member, co-worker. We're sorry that George has passed away, but at the same time, we saw in George a, an abidance in Jesus Christ. And so we have complete confidence that George, he rests in Jesus. Be with us as we contemplate his life, as we contemplate the wonderful blessed hope that God gives each of us. Be with us this hour, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to change up our program just a little bit. We're going to have our scripture, and then we will have our obituary reading. Pastor Barry has arrived, so we're glad for that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, children, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. George Robert Rakestraw was born the fourth of nine children on August 12, 1936. He was a son of the late Joe and Ethel Rakestraw. After high school, George went to work for the SNS cafeteria system as head chef. His job took him all over the southeast, training cooks how to prepare the different diet orders. Eventually, he was assigned to Grace Hospital. After SNS lost that contract, George chose to remain in Morganton, first working in a furniture factory, which I understand he didn't like very well, then Broughton Hospital, where he worked for the next 30 years. He must have liked that one a whole lot more. On the side, George worked as a veterinary assistant, raised chihuahuas, I guess there's a relationship there, and groomed dogs in their home. George and Kay owns an antique business for 12 years. George was introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist message by Elder Ed Herzl and Irvin Linhart, and on October 18, 1997, George and Kay were baptized by Elder Tony Serigliano, thus becoming members of the Morganton Seventh-day Adventist Church until his death on August 12. He loved studying his Bible and teaching a Sabbath school class. George is survived by his daughters, Kathy Rakestraw, Gwendolyn Rakestraw Owens, and husband Ronald, grandchildren Ronnie Owen, Karan Owen, Tyron Rutherford, great-grandchildren Armand and Jaden Owens, brother Isaiah Rakestraw, and a number of nieces and nephews and others extended family members. And that's probably most of you as well. In addition to his parents, George is preceded in death by his wife, Kay Francis Rakestraw, 
brothers Joe Rakestraw, Eugene Rakestraw, sisters Ke Carrie Winchester, Willie May Norwood, Grace Winchester, Sarah Sowell, Louise Walker, Leola Avery. George now sleeps until that great getting up morning when once again he will be reunited with the family and friends who have loved Jesus more than anything or anybody.
several at this time are going to come up and sh share a couple of minute tributes about George. Come on, folks. On behalf of our family, let me first of all say thank you very much, Pastor Steve, Pastor Barry, to all of the members of the Morganton Seventh-day Adventist Church for accommodating the family today on your Sabbath day. Thank you after your service today. You wanted to make the love of God known to our family during this time of bereavement. So we want to say thank you very, very much and for that lovely song. George invited me into the family in 1981. And when he invited me in, he told me, you take care of my daughter, Gwendolyn, and she can always come home. Before you think about touching her, <laughs> you let her come home. So she hadn't had to come home. <laughs> Want to just share three points of a sermon. I guess y'all say, uh-oh, you know, preachers with points. But I'm just going to share three spiritual gifts that George displayed that I saw always. And it was a spiritual gift of knowledge. George had a thirst for knowledge of the scripture. He would read, he would study, he would debate. And out of that knowledge, he gained wisdom. And that wisdom was he lived out the scripture. And then the gift of teaching. He taught God's word also there in the Sabbath school. So we celebrate the life of a person who shared the spiritual gifts that God gave him for family and friends. Thank you all again. God bless you and God keep you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for coming today to celebrate the life of George Robert Rakestraw, my dad. I feel so grateful to have had so much time with daddy. I miss him so much already. As, and really don't know how long it's going to take me to get through this grieving period because he was such a tremendous part of my life. I have so many memories. I remember his love for his family, for his friends, his patience, his understanding, his wisdom, his humor, and most of all, his spiritual teachings and guidance. The memories of Daddy will always be in my heart as his illness worsened over the years, he continued to say, when asked, all is well with me and my Savior. Amen. Now I can truly say that all is well with you and your Savior. Scripture says to be, to be, with, with, to be out of the body is to be present with the Lord. Thomas Dorsey wrote this, Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Now that Daddy's been led to heaven's gate, we all must say farewell, but never goodbye, for we will see him on the other side. Amen. Amen. August 12, 2021, George Robert Rakestraw turned 85 years old. But this birthday, he didn't say, what did you get me? 
or shake the card until some money fell out. This birthday, he shared his love. He spent this birthday talking to each one of his children, grandchildren, and son-in-law individually to tell them how much he loved them. That was George Rakestraw. Yes, he was known for making everyone laugh. His antiques, German shepherds, chihuahuas, and a garden or what I like to call a farm. But more importantly, he was known as a pillar of strength for our family, teaching us about Jesus, singing songs together, and loving us all unconditionally. He taught us that we come from good stuff, and nobody can ever stop us from being who God called us to be. He would often go without just to ensure that his loved ones were well taken care of. But to me, he, he wasn't just a grandfather. He was my best friend, my public speaking coach, my biggest cheerleader, and my listening ear. He always would say, Ronice, don't you worry about anything. Just focus on school and don't take any wooden nickels. A few weeks ago, I was able to come and visit him. My mom, Aunt Kathy, and I sang along with Paw Paw, a song I always used to sing as a kid, Oh Mary, Don't You Weep. As Paw Paw was directing us, and we were singing, and we said, Paw Paw, are we good enough to go on tour? And he looked up and made that curious face of his and said, mm, not quite. <laughs> well, Paw Paw, you now are on tour, and you have the greatest tour of all, the Jesus tour, where there's no pain, no crying, no worry, just peace, everlasting peace, and you're reunited with Nanny on the Jesus tour. So, Paw Paw, enjoy your Jesus tour. I'll see you later. You ran your race, you fought a good fight, you finished the course, and now you've passed the baton on to each one of us to continue the race. We won't let you down. We've got that rake straw blood in us. We won't let you down. So when peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows, like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught us to say, it is well, it is well with our soul. Now be at peace, Papa. We love you. We are having a service today that God never intended we have. But as the centuries, as the millenniums have rolled by, funeral after funeral after funeral, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or highly educated or lowly educated, no matter what color you are, you face a funeral. But God never intended it that way. Well-known individuals certainly often speak at funerals, at memorials. They share their thoughts on life, the loss of life. Author and illustrator Theodore Seuss Gazelle, better known as Dr. Seuss, at the funeral for his first wife, Helen Palmer, he would say this at her funeral, I don't cry because her life has ended, I smile because her life has happened. And I like that. Or Abraham Lincoln. At the funeral for his son, Tad. If you remember, Tad died at the young age of 18. And so at that funeral, Abraham Lincoln said, It's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years that count. I like that one too. Queen Elizabeth II. Queen Elizabeth II at the death of her husband, Prince Philip, just this year. Queen Elizabeth would say, Grief is the price you pay when you love. Indeed. Maybe the greatest American composer ever, Irving Berlin. Irving Boleyn at the funeral of his wife, Dorothy. Dorothy and Irving went to Cuba for their honeymoon. And while there, there was a typhoid breakout. And sure enough, 
Irving Berlin's new wife, Dorothy, would come down with typhoid when they returned to the States. And after only being married for six months, Dorothy would pass away. And at the funeral, Irving Berlin would say, The song has ended, but oh, how the melody lingers on. And so we know. We, we, we know what Arthur, Do, Arthur Dr. Seuss said at his wife's funeral, and we, we know what Abraham Lincoln said at the funeral for his son, Tad. And we know what Queen Elizabeth said at the funeral for her husband, Prince Philip. And we know what Irving Berlin said at his wife Dorothy's funeral. But there was a funeral that we don't have any idea what was said. The opportunity was there. The sisters had sent a message to catch up with Jesus and tell him that one of his best friends, their brother, Lazarus, was sick. And the way John the disciple tells about the incident, they could have made it to Bethany for the funeral. They could have. There was a funeral that we do not know what was said at the funeral. It was a funeral held in a small suburban town near Jerusalem called Bethany, just around the Mount of Olives. We know that Lazarus, a very good friend of Jesus, would become sick. And so we do not know what was said at the, at the funeral for Lazarus of Bethany as they laid him in his tomb. We don't know. We missed the funeral, and Jesus is to blame. In fact... Jesus arrived after the funeral of burial of Lazarus, and it appears from Scripture, Jesus purposely arrived in Bethany after the funeral and after the burial was over. In fact, we have it on, uh, in Scripture that He said, I'm glad we missed it. Wow. Glad we missed the funeral. And so we don't know what happened. We don't know what was said. Funerals were different in many respects in the first century than they are today. One way in particular, they were much, much longer. Funerals could go on for days, at least a portion of it. They were longer simply in the first place because of logistics. They could not pick up a phone and call family members far and near to come to the funeral next Tuesday. They, they couldn't do that. They had to send messengers all over the place, and so it took time. And then travel time was also not as quick as our day. We can be here in, in, in Morganton in, in a matter of hours or at least very quickly. But not so in the first century. The main mode of transportation, their feet. They had to walk. And so thus it took some time to travel the miles of family members lived far away. But supposedly, something very interesting that made the funeral last longer was how important the family made the individual who has died out to be. Part of it was built in this time of crying. If you had people crying at your funeral, then that's how much more important you were. Kind of a bizarre idea. Based on how much crying was at the funeral, told you how special you were. How special the family was. When people cried at the funeral, and how long the crying lasted, all showed the importance of the one who had died and the family of the person. More crying, more important. In fact, how much crying was such a critical factor of assessing one's importance in life that it was very popular. In, in fact, it was expected that the family paid criers to cry. 
Now, I owned a printing company for many years, but I never saw on anybody's resume that someone handed me, I was paid to cry. I never saw that. Paid to cry. And by the way, men, because it was unseemly at that time for a man to cry in public, for a man to shed tears was unseemly, and so paid criers were always women. Always. When Jesus arrives, too late for the funeral of his friend Lazarus, well, guess what is still going on? Lazarus, they've had the funeral. Lazarus has been buried, but what is still happening? Crying. Professional ladies, they're still crying. Still going strong. So strong that Jesus could hear it a block away. Because Jesus could hear the hired mourners crying from a block away, Christ did not go to the home of Lazarus where the two sisters were, but instead he sends a mass messenger and lets them know, I'm here. I'm on the edge of town. I'm not coming to the house with that racket going on. Now, what we have recorded, I told you we, the funeral's not recorded. We don't have that. We don't have what was said at the funeral when they buried Lazarus. But I tell you, I am so glad that we have the conversation after the funeral that Jesus has with the oldest sister, Martha. It's words that we find in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, Beginning with verse 21. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I think she's right. I think it's hard to die with Jesus in the room. But even now, Martha said, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, well, I, I, I know that he will rise again at the, in the resurrection at the last day. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. We missed what was said at the funeral for Lazarus and the words that were shared there as they put Lazarus in the tomb, we have no idea what they said. But oh, that, how thankful we can be that we have the recorded statements made by Jesus Christ, I am the resurrection. You know, several times in the course of his three and a half year ministry of Jesus, we, we hear him saying, I am, I am, I am, I am. In fact, seven times he says, I am, in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the resurrection. All of those in John. The Lord told Martha, and by extension, He tells you and me, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, death is not the final word for those in Jesus Christ. It is not the final word. When I first arrived here in Morganton as pastor of the Morganton Seventh Adventist Church, George was coming to church. See him, not maybe every week, but many weeks. He'd stay for fellowship lunch. And we'd, I'd enjoy sitting at the table with George as we ate together. He was a joy to be around. And well, then the COVID pandemic invaded our lives. And so consequently, we shut the church down for a while. And even when we opened it back up, George's health was not one that would allow him to come back to church so quickly with the pandemic raging on. 
I would visit George in his home. The last time I visited George was a couple of Sabbaths, a couple of Saturdays ago. We call them Sabbaths. A couple of Sabbaths ago, after I left church, I swung by the hospital. And George and Deborah and I, my wife, we, we had a conversation there and talked. George's mind was having a hard time even then focusing on some questions that I asked. But when I asked George if I could pray, oh, no problem there. And I took his hand. And we prayed together. And I asked God to heal George if it was his will. But at the same time, we acknowledged that if healing was not to be for George, he was ready for Jesus Christ. And I believe John who recorded Christ saying, I am the resurrection. He also wrote the book of Revelation where he was told that God shall wipe away a few tears. <laughs> All tears. Every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, no more funerals. That'll be a great day, won't it? When we will no longer gather for these occasions to hear what pastors say, to hear what anybody says. George believed in the coming of that day when there would be no more funerals. I believe in that coming of that day, that blessed hope that tells us that, there, that it is not death, it is not the grave that has the last laugh. Not then. If faithful to our God, we will see George again. And through the years of eternity, we will have a joy that knows no limit, knows no boundary. It is my prayer that you and that I and that George, we will all be together again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the life of George. I was so glad to know George for a couple of years as he attended the Morgan and Seventh Avenue Church. And Father, I know what he believed. He believed that by abiding in Jesus Christ, eternal life would be his. We agree with George. And we're so pleased that we can know the blessed hope that tells us that someday these kind of services will no longer be necessary. We'll never know ever again what somebody says at a funeral. Thank you for the blessing of knowing that Jesus Christ is our resurrection and our life. Amen. We're going to give you an opportunity to share briefly thoughts, but I want the opportunity to take the first shot. I came to, we came to Morganton in 2009, so it wasn't long before I got acquainted with George Rakestraw. And George had a way of asking some of the strangest questions. It took me a while to figure him out. <laughs> It's a good thing I did, or I would have been offended. I remember the time he said, are you planning to stay around? <laughs> and I said, well, George, do you have other plans for me? <laughs> no. And then came the day when he said to me, he says, you don't like us very much, do you? And I said, George, no. No. I love you. I love you. It's not just like. George was a friend. He loved the Lord, he loved his church, he loved the Word of God. And finally I got to know him well enough to know that 
He just wouldn't smile when he was laughing inside. <laughs> he wanted to see me squirm. I, I wouldn't be surprised so to say I was his target. But it sure did seem like that. Love the man, him and Kay. We're very, very special people. And I'm sure there's somebody else, again, keep them fairly short so that people who have opportunity want to. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, protocol is, but probably best if you stand up and lower your mask maybe so we can hear you and understand. Ted, I think I see you about ready to move. Still a target. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. All right, someone else? All right. <laughs> if he had just grinned a little bit when he said those kind of things, it would have been helpful. <laughs> Someone else? Get Gail?
go on a picnic, and the very first one, there was a bear came out of the woods, and we had just got our food out. And I said, oh, no, what are we going to feed him? And Kay says, we ain't feeding him none of our stuff. <laughs> and into the car we go. And then we got rained on a couple of times, but we just enjoyed their fellowship. He was so knowledgeable about things, and Kay was so loving, and they were so devoted to each other. It's really, really a hard thing to say goodbye. But we do have the blessed hope of seeing each other again one day, and that's what I live for, to see them again. Amen. Joanne? I just wanted to say that George was my Sabbath school teacher at one time, and uh, we could joke with each other, and some people would be offended by what we would say to each other, but he never got offended. And uh, once in a while I would be sick, and hear him and Kay would come, bring me a fruit basket, and Kay would sometimes sweep my front porch. She said, it needs to be swept. I said, okay, go right ahead. But they were wonderful people, and we all loved George. He was a great Sabbath school teacher. Thank you. Amen. Steve? I just want to have say that I had the privilege of working with George at Broad. I saw him in action. He could handle about anything. He would study your face and study the situation before he spoke. When I went down to draw blood, he would have a, those young guys lined up. And I have to say that most of them don't want to see a needle coming at them to draw their blood. But George would have them lined up, and they would be saying, thank you. And George knew how to do it. He, was, he had an answer for everything. He was always kind of slow, and he would think it out before he said it. But we had many, many good nights of talk and work together, talked about everything from religion to the world and kids and everything else. So he's a, he was a good man. I loved him. I always considered him a very special friend. He's a good man. I think that was my problem. I didn't study his face long enough before I responded to him. <laughs> Hand back in the back. Uh, Neil? Well, when we moved to Morton Church, we, we knew George, you know, us, hey, George, how are you today? You know, something like that. We didn't have much conversations, but we were both serving as deacons, and George had to go to Mission Memorial Hospital for heart surgery, I believe it was. And I stopped by to visit him, and we had a little chat, and I said, George, is there anything you need? Do I need to donate blood? Or he, he was amazed that I would offer to donate blood. Well, I didn't have to do that, but I would have. And I told him, I said, Jesus blood covers our sins he gave his blood for us so later on every time he would see me and with someone that I didn't know he introduced me to him and he said this man offered to give me blood he, he made it you know something funny out of that for, for him uh, but I never did understand when he was joking and when he was serious I never got it thank you Neil I appreciate that <laughs> so Someone else. We don't want to just prolong it, but we want everybody to have opportunity. There was a hand in the back, actually. Before. Okay. Oh. Uh, I appreciated George a lot as a Sabbath school teacher when I moved back here. But I mostly remember after my dad had a stroke and brought him home. George called and he said, I bet you need some help. And I said, well, I can't think of it. He said, I can. I'm coming over because I know you have to go get groceries. You have to go do things to make things happen. And he and Kay came over several times and stayed with my dad two or three hours while I could go and take care of things that I needed to do. And that was always very special. I loved him very much. Amen. It was one other thing, Kathy, you might want to collect from. Um, I was doing Sabbath school for a while, and I was talking about lessons from the wolves. I did not know he was a vet tech or that he ran a farm. So I never quite, but he always had something to add to the lessons from the wolves. And he said, Gwen, I just got to have that book. Bring me that book. And I never got it to him. So if anybody from that family wants the lessons from the wolves, your dad really enjoyed that series we did and I would share that book with you. 
And, and, and so your dad and I could tell tales. So I'm going to tell a tale on your dad. So uh, 49 years ago, well, I'm, we, the clinic was out in a little garage. We had a Volkswagen bus. We had two children. I had two dogs. And we opened the clinic in a garage. Well, one afternoon, this big, tall African-American guy comes in. He's wearing scrubs. And he says, uh, Doc, I want to work for you. I said, what's your name? He said, George Rapestraw. I said, oh, OK, George. I said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm at Broughton and I work the night shift. He said, but I want to come work for you during the day because I got Chihuahua. Well, you always had some Chihuahuas or something. Oh, I got Chihuahuas. I want to learn more about it. I said, it's great, George. I can't find feed my family. I sure heck can't pay for you. you know, I can't pay you. He thinks it's, I'll work for free. You're on, man. You're on. <laughs> so we started. Well, I, all we had was a Volkswagen bus, but George had the, I don't know if y'all remember that old blue Chevy that thing, and then the back seat was out of it. And, uh, and so we would do some large animal calls with this. We'd go out and do large animal calls. So uh, I'd load the stuff up, and one of my daughters said she swore with George, uh, and my kids all remember George. We put her in the back, and there were four chickens back there when we made the call. I still don't believe that, but anyway, she says. So we'd get out to these places, and we'd really see some kind of horrific stuff. Uh, example. Uh, we'd pull up to a place, and there'd be a cow tied to a tree, and there'd be about eight people standing around. There'd be a tractor over here, and there'd be a leg of a calf <laughs> on the rope that they'd pulled out. And then George and I came, and we're supposed to do something. So George was smoking then. He smoked Salem? Was it Salem? God, what that was it? So Joe, we get out of the car, and George would go lean on the car, and you can see him doing this, and he'd pull out a smoke. He'd go like this. Mm -mm. And they'd say, my oh my, my oh my. And then I'd look over and say, uh, he said, what are we going to do, Doc? And I said, well, I'm not so sure. I'd say, give me a smoke. So <laughs> we'd both sit there puffing away like this, and then we'd figure out something and do it. Well, one day this went on about for four or five weeks, and we stopped, and we were having our powwow, just getting ready, and George lights up. And I said to him, um, George, give me a smoke. He said, hmm. I said, what? I said, give me a smoke, man. He said, no, uh -uh, I ain't going to do that. I said, well, George, what's going on? He says, I don't mind working for you for nothing, but I'll be damned if I'm going to give you any more cigarettes till, till you pay me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he said damn, but I think he, <laughs> you pay me, Doc. Uh, you know, I quit smoking, and I paid him. <laughs> he, is a, he was so much a part of our family. And uh, he's just a good man. You can be proud of him, and I'm proud he was my friend. Thank you. I want to see your eyes. And let you hear that. He was only partially a changed man, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm holding on to the microphone. They asked me to. Evidently, Sossamans only wants me to get COVID, and none of the rest of you. Do. I'm the only one they want to get sick. So. There was a hand up here. Was it Wayne? You're not worried about it? No, sir. All right. I got Jesus on my side. Uh, George Rexrout, fine fellow. Loved him to death. We'd go and we'd have lunch. He's one cook. I mean, he was a good cook. But we'd talk about things up through his life. It was amazing what he could do. Things he would say, and he was like, he was, he's really smart. He was smart. But I never saw him get excited. I could go to his place, you know, and talk to him up on 181. And uh, I was uh, kind of raised up rough. And uh, I told him, you know, about when, when I was growing up and stuff. And my wife was going to kind of frown on this. But I told him, George said, George, how was you? I said, well, I was doing good growing up. And I run into Gail, the love of my life. But I asked her to marry her. And she said, well, so what's wrong with that? I said, well, at the time, I was living out of a car. And she said, well, he said, well, what did your wife tell you? He says, well, I can't marry you. You ain't got nowhere to live. 
but uh, we've been married about 50 years. I love her too. But uh, Kay and, and George are wonderful people. Uh, if I could do anything for y'all, I'm just a phone call away. I love him. I miss him. But he was one fine person. Thank you. All right, up here in front, on the right, on my right. You want me to hold it? You know about it. Uh, George was my neighbor. He lived about two houses up from me, and he was also a, a large brother. And uh, I would see George working in the yard, cutting grass, trimming the flowers, things like that, and I would stop, and we would talk. And uh, oftentimes, we would take trips up and down the highway. We would travel to different meetings, and George would go from one story to the next, next story to the next, next. And uh, oftentimes, we'd ask him, says, George, he said, are you making up these stories, or are you just, uh, uh, are you just, the choice is real. And he said they're real. So we kind of questioned that every now and then. <laughs> but uh, he would have us laughing. He was real well knowledgeable in uh, veterinarian and culinary. And uh, he knew a little bit about everything. And oftentimes he would come and cook at the lodge back then and uh, cook breakfast for us during meetings. And, you know, he had the usual, you know, bacon and eggs and uh, liver mush and grits. And on this particular morning, uh, someone had bought some fresh corn in. He shook it and, and cut the corn and creamed it and put the corn in the middle of the table. And we said, I ain't eat no corn for breakfast. I said, but George said, try. And we said, we didn't try, so we ate the, the breakfast and everything. So we spent a couple of hours there, and then you see one brother get up and get a little of that corn. And by lunchtime, all the corn was gone. So George, George got the last laugh. He said, see, you talked about my corn, but you sat there and ate every bit of it. <laughs> but George was a good man, and uh, we all loved him, and anything he could we needed he would help us out and uh, all you had to do was call him so uh, he's going to be missed pastor ronald was was this letter to be read from the church okay sorry if i read it now sorry. <clears throat> this is from the mount olive american methodist episcopal church where you're the senior pastor but this wasn't written by him to the family of Brother George Robert Rakestraw, your beloved family, the Mount Olive AME Church, and I, with so many of Brother George Robert Rakestraw's friends and family members, in expressing our love and sympathy at the transition of a beloved loved one and child of God. We knew Brother George Robert Rakestraw through our fellowship with his daughter, uh, Lady Gwendolyn Owens, and son-in-law, Reverend Robert L. Ronald, excuse me, L. Owens, However, we know you remember him as a faithful servant of God. While we grieve with the family and friends of Brother George Robert Rakestraw, we rejoice in knowing that he is now resting from his labor. Brother George Robert Rakestraw has finished the race. He kept the faith, and now there is a reward for him in which the righteous judge shall give on that day. My prayer is that God will grant you peace, strength, comfort, and all that you need as you grieve together as a family. Be reminded that Brother George Robert Rakestraw would want you to go on with your lives, accomplish your goals, and honor him in your service for God. As hard as it may be for you right now, say goodbye and let him go. Be assured that on the other side, Jesus and that great host of witnesses are saying hello. Trust God to heal the wound of grief, leaving a scar as a reminder of the memories that you will have of Brother George Robert Rakestraw forever. Have faith in knowing that in the days to come, the scar, known as memories, will be without the pain you are experiencing now. This is how God heals the wound of grief. Remember that earth has no sorrows, and heaven cannot heal. Be blessed and find peace as you rest in the arms of a comforting and loving Savior. God bless, Reverend Dana Swan, pastor, assistant to pastor. Before we close, we're going to sing together a hymn. It's actually in your program. Just one verse of How Great Thou Art is, is there in the program. And after we sing our song, we'll have our closing prayer. And then I ask that you stay standing as the, as the family uh, proceeds uh, out and uh, they prepare to go to Burke Memorial. Now, is Burke just for the family or does just for the family? I mean, I realize... I'm going to, but it's, it's just for the family. And then, okay, great.
And so let's stand together as we sing How Great Thou Art. Father, you are a great God. We're thankful to know that Jesus really is the resurrection and the life. Please wrap your arms around this dear family. Strengthen, comfort, give hope. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that needs to say yes to you, that you will plead with their hearts. Lord, we thank you for the legacy that George left for us all. His joy of life, his love for you and your word. And I pray that you will bless us each with a commitment to serve you that we might see him again. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. We pray it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.